Hello, hello! Welcome to another episode of History in the Dark. I am your host, Darkness the Curse. And before we begin, as always, thank you so much to my generous patrons, my British Rail critics, and of course, my underwater train finders. You are the reason why this content remains heavily modified. Uh, not at all. It, it, it's... It, it starts out the same way every time, pretty much. And today, we're going to talk about locomotive modifications. Because sometimes locomotives are modified or rebuilt or something. And sometimes those go really well. And sometimes these modifications, or alternate versions of a pre-existing design, are, are not so... Not, not so great. Um, no. These are five failed train modifications. And I take train because some of these don't have to do with locomotives, so I just said train overall. I know the difference between a train and a locomotive, I'm not an idiot, okay? Talk to the YouTube algorithm. Train tracks better than locomotives, it's one of those things. Ha, train tracks. Get it? Beep! I love this locomotive. Look at her. She's so cute. The beep was sometimes referred to as SWBLW, which we're not going to call her. Her name's Beep. Is Santa Fe number 1460, which is a single example of a switcher that was technically a rebuild in 1970 performed by Atchison, Topeka, and Santa Fe Railway at their Claiborne, Texas workshops. The reason she's called Beep is that it's a portmanteau of a BB wheel arrangement and the Baldwin Geep. Hence, beep. And yes, she is based off of a Baldwin diesel locomotive, specifically a Baldwin model V01000. We have talked about the beep before, but I figured we'd talk about her again because why not? What happened was Santa Fe had a very successful line of rebuilds, the CF7s, that were actually EMDF units, but they had their streamlined car body removed and replaced with a custom made general purpose body. Basically, they turned the F units into hood units. The idea was that rebuilding them, modifying them somehow, was going to be cheaper than buying new locomotives. And in the CF7's case, that was totally correct. The rebuilds were successful, and some of the CF7s are actually still in service as of now. The beep was another idea for a rebuild program. But since the Baldwin switchers were already hood units, the plan this time was to basically re-engine them. Baldwin's diesel engines were non-standard, and they were getting old, so they wanted to replace those with EMD prime movers, which would make it easier on maintenance as well as give them just new engines in general, making them last longer, since the bodies themselves were fine. So why didn't it go well? The CF7s went well. What was wrong with Beep? Well, it had to do with cost. Turns out that while rebodying a locomotive actually was cheaper than buying new, re-engining was not the case. The beep was more expensive than actually just buying outright brand new switchers from EMD. So the whole rebuild program was pointless. There was no cost savings in it. So the beep remains a single example. While the modification was technically a failure from a financial perspective, she did actually work. And since they already rebuilt her, they still used her, because why not? She actually was very popular among crews. She had superior riding qualities compared to other switchers, and she was well-loved for many years. So well-loved that she was donated in May of 2009 to the Western American Railroad Museum in Barstow, California, where she remains now on static display. So, yeah, the modification procedures did not work the way they were hoping, but everyone still loves her. And that's still kind of a win. The EMD BL20-2. The heck is a BL20-2? Well, these were models of diesel electric locomotives produced by EMD in 1992. Since they were produced by EMD, why are these on a list of modifications or rebuilds or anything like that? Well, that's because they are rebuilds. They were designed as rebuilds of EMD GP9s. And they included a lot of newer technology, like an alternator and electronics that were equivalent to those of the Dash 2 line of locomotives, hence why they were BL20-2. Despite the designation though, they're totally unrelated to EMD BL2s, just so we're clear. And they produced three of the demonstrators, numbered 120 to 122, 
and they performed fairly well, all things considered. Nobody bought them. Not a soul. Not a single person was interested in buying these particular diesels. They just weren't that interesting. No one had a need for them. Even though they technically worked, they just weren't really worth it to anybody, so nobody bought anymore. So no more Beyond the Three were ever built. Part of the problem was that at that time, rebuilds were in full swing. That market was actually pretty big, and there was lots of competition. The bl 20 2s struggled to find a place in that market, and never did. The three demonstrators actually do remain in service. As part of a locomotive leasing company, however, that's run by GATX and EMD's licensing division. So, yeah, they are still being used, so much like the beep, it isn't so much that these modifications were bad. The rebuilds did work, and they worked well. It's just no one really wanted them for one reason or another. But from here on, things get a lot weirder. Wind splitting. What? Is it streamlining? Well, yes and no. Let me try to explain. The term streamlining hadn't actually been adopted back when wind splitting was a thing. And the first time it was ever introduced, based on my research, was in 1883 in France. The idea was similar to streamlining, just not nearly as extreme. The idea was to make the locomotives more aerodynamic to improve their speed. Trains were getting faster in general. So in their minds, it made sense to try to decrease wind resistance, but aerodynamics as a field was very much in its infancy. No one really had a good understanding of how aerodynamics worked. And remember, planes weren't even invented, so there were a lot of things they had to work out. Most of the wind splitting ideas look rather strange, and not nearly as stylish as a lot of later streamlining would be. And the problem with wind splitting, more than anything else, isn't so much that it was a bad concept in the sense of reducing wind resistance, because modern high speed trains do do that by having very sleek, low profile designs. No, the issue is that there was no point in it back then. It was the late 1800s, and yeah, trains were getting faster, but not fast enough that the wind resistance was having really any effect on the overall speed. Any benefits gained from wind splitting was so negligible that it could barely be measured at all. We're talking like a thousandth of a percent difference in terms of speed. There was no point to designing the locomotives this way because it was a complete waste of time. As locomotives got faster, breaking 100 miles per hour, for example, and beyond, then the notion of making them sleeker and more air resistant did make some logical sense. But back then, fast was like 50 miles an hour, tops, maybe a little faster than that, give or take. And at that speed, the wind resistance was so negligible that there was just no point in splitting the wind in this case. Rubber railway tires. No. No, they didn't really try that, did they? Oh, yeah. Yeah, they did. On multiple occasions, on multiple different railways, there's actually many different examples of this being attempted. And guess what? It never worked. Ever. At any point. It was always a failure. The reason why they would have gone with what they called pneumatic rail wheels was the smooth nature of running on rubber. Steel on steel is rather, well, clumsy and chaotic. It's rough in many cases, but steel is sturdy. Rubber is softer and still very durable. And the result was that the ride quality of the coaches fitted with these types of wheels, as well as the occasional locomotive that was, ran much, much smoother and quieter down tracks. Great. And they weren't just regular car tires on rails because that would be really dumb. No, 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 no. They were designed with the rail in mind. They were fitted with metal flanges in order to keep the coach on the rails, for one, and were inflated to a pressure of 85 pounds per square inch. Generally, that varied depending on who was making them. And inside the tire was a wooden hoop, which meant that if there was a deflation, which did happen, it wouldn't necessarily cause the wheel to fly off the rails, which is... Good, thank you for thinking of that. Rubber on steel also was much better for stopping, as the friction was different. They had better grip on the rails, and if they had to stop, they could stop a lot faster than a typical train. 
So why didn't they start using them? Well, in all cases, they all had the same problem. They wore out extremely fast, much faster than steel. And that increased maintenance costs, which railroads hated. They had to change the wheels far, far too often for it to be worth it. Yeah, there were a lot of benefits, but not enough benefits to justify the tremendous cost. Yeah, steel on steel had a lot of weaknesses technically, but they did last a lot longer. And when it came to trains that had to run on a near constant basis on very busy lines, not having to change the tires was, um, well, kind of nice. It's really nice not to have to do that. The rubber just couldn't stand up to the constant beating of a busy rail line. And thus, every time it was used, it wound up being a failure. Paper wheels. Yes, really. There was a time where trains ran on wheels that were made of paper. Are you kidding me? What possible reason could they have had to ever consider that that was a good idea? Well, back in the 19th century, railroads were very bumpy. There was pretty much no suspension, so it could be an uncomfortable ride. And for high-class express service, they wanted to give train-goers a much better, smoother experience. So a man by the name of Richard N. Allen, who was an American locomotive engineer, came up with a solution to this particular problem. He decided that wheels should be made of a material that absorbs vibrations very well, not solid metal. And that material was paper. In 1867, Allen actually already had a company that manufactured paper from straw, and he utilized that paper to make train wheels. Really? They weren't completely paper, because that would be ridiculous, if it wasn't already, but hear me out. For one thing, paper, yes, is flexible and soft, but large pieces of paper is still a wood product, and if you stack a whole bunch of paper together, I mean, try ripping a phone book in half. Unless you're a bodybuilder, it's pretty difficult. It's not like paper is necessarily a weak material in bulk. What they did was punch out huge paper discs, and they were laminated together using a simple flour-based glue. Those paper composites were then joined together until a 200-sheet thick disc was created. That was then compressed with a 650-ton hydraulic press, and it was allowed to dry for six to eight weeks, and then turned on a lathe to make it round. It was then sandwiched again between two metal discs, allowed the wheel to be attached to a standard railroad car. The contact surface was, in fact, a thick metal ring. So the paper never actually touched the rail, but it was predominantly the major component of the wheel. The effect was that the wheels were a lot softer and much better at absorbing vibrations and dampening the noise. Soon the company began receiving large orders for these new paper wheels. In 1871, the Pullman Company actually ordered 100 of such wheels, and they were fitted on sleeping and dining cars because, well, those are the cars that really needed them. By 1886, the wheels were actually being used globally, though most of the demand for them was in the United States. And in Richard Allen's defense, the wheels did technically work. They did what they were supposed to do. They dampened the noise and absorbed the vibrations. Trains became a lot smoother as a result of these wheels. But at what cost, Richard? See, there was a problem with these wheels, it was found out. <clears throat> and it may seem obvious to us in retrospect, but um, there's a lot of weight and a lot of speed that, that happens with trains. And as time went on, it was discovered that the paper wheels had a little bit of an itsy bitsy major, major fault. They were banned as early as 1915 because they weren't safe at all. Regular steel wheels did wear out and need replacing too, but the difference between them and the paper wheels was the steel wheels wore out very gradually over time. It was easy to see when they needed to be replaced. Paper wheels, however, did not show obvious signs of degradation until, well, they failed. They would fail suddenly and spectacularly and actually cause several accidents. This is because they fell apart from the inside, not the outside. While the metal looked fine, the paper was slowly rotting away and degrading. So when they failed, they really failed. And it got people killed. 
When the ban happened, they never made paper wheels again, and rail lines were also improving in their overall quality compared to the way they had been. Even when they switched back to just using steel, the ride was a lot smoother. Suspension systems were added to coaches, so there was no need for a special wheel that could also kill everybody without any kind of warning. And I think that's for the best, you know, it's just one of those things. And with that, a special thank you to all my underwater train finders. Some do 267, Orange Glass, Benjamin Owens, Panzer Kitsu, 131, just 232, Josh Johnson, Metal for Life Guy, Anzac A1, Arthur Roy, Tommy Rossini, Lord Captain Von Thrust III, Joshua Long, Brian, Jack Carson's Railroad Videos, Hayden DeGro, Master of None, Dr. Racer78, Lord Hoth444, Alaric Jaspers, The Baxter, That Guy With A Beard, Mark Holding, Lock Kraken, Crystal Morgan, A Person723, DM Tribal Typhoon, Ohio Trucker1, Hendrick Motorsports Fan 5, Alfonso Lapuche, and Royal Hudson 2860. Till next time, this is Darkness, and we draw Lafond, farewell.